I've entitled today's message, Don't Let Fear Keep You Out. You know, we all have fears. Fear is typically illogical. It's emotional. It's non-reasonable. But it can grip us and make us do things or keep us out of things that if we didn't have fear, we would go into. You know, my... My wife, Dee, who led the bell choir, I feel like she sometimes can be this uh, brave, ferocious woman. I have seen her stand in the face of big dudes, tatted up, and say, if you touch this woman one more time, you're going to have to deal with me. And I'm like, whoa, that tiger. (laughs) But there's other things that she's very, very afraid of. Like years ago, we were in our house, and... There happened to be a mouse that got, that she saw a mouse in our house. And I saw this brave, courageous, fearless woman. Well, I walked into the house and to my surprise, I saw her with big rubber boots on, a broom in her hand, on top of the table, her mascara running down her face because she was like crying afraid in a broom like this. And I walked in, I wanted to laugh like, hey, what's going on? She said, not funny. (laughs) Well, Well, what's happening? Why are you on top of the table with the broom? She said, there's a mouse in this house and I am not gonna live with a mouse in my house. I said, honey, it's just a little, no. I'm not going to live. I'm going to go to a hotel and find a place until you get this mouse out of the house. Just a paranoid fear of mice. And so she, she went out of the house and refused to come in until I got that mouse. You know how hard it is to catch a mouse? And so, you know, but prayer brings those, I'm like, Lord Jesus, I don't want to spend three days at a hotel while they're trying to catch a mouse. So I started praying and yes, Lo and behold, it's never happened to me before. I moved some couches and I saw the mouse. It started running. I actually got it trapped into the bathroom. I got a broom and I'll spare you the gory details. But I, I was like a knight in a shining armor. It's like I slow, it's like I'd slain the dragon. I mean, I was her hero at killing that little mouse. Sometimes fear will keep us out of places we should be in. Fear, irrational, can keep us out of our destiny, can keep us out of our call, can keep us from taking steps of obedience that we know we need to make. Fear sometimes can keep us out of the very places that God is asking us, encouraging us, saying, step into it, but fear can keep us out. You know, it's interesting, you read the quote-unquote Christmas story, And I was struck by this the other day that there are four times in the Christmas story that the word fear is mentioned of four different types of people. The old King James says, fear not. Uh, The new version says, don't be afraid. And I thought, wow, this is the Christmas story. Jesus coming to earth, one of the most exciting times, the pivotal points in the universe, a crucial point in time, yet Four different people have to be told, do not be afraid. Zacharias, who was the, uh, a priest, uh, he has to be told by the angel Gabriel, don't be afraid. Mary, who's the 16-year-old, probably about a 16-year-old girl, she has to be told by the angel, don't be afraid. Joseph has to be told also by an angel, don't be afraid. The shepherds that are out uh, encounter this heavenly host and the first thing that they're told is do not be afraid and I believe that sometimes when God is about to do something good when God is leading us into a new season when transition is happening when something good is about to take place sometimes fear can keep us out of a good thing so I want us to look at that for a moment and I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 Luke, the first chapter. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Fear sometimes can keep you from accepting your answer to prayer. 
Notice Zacharias. You probably haven't heard much about Zacharias because he's not a main character in the Christmas story, but he is an important character. It tells us in Luke, the first chapter, verse 13, that an angel of the Lord appeared to Zacharias and he said to him, what? Do not be afraid. Zacharias, your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will call him John. Uh, Some of you know the story of Zacharias, but Zacharias was a priest, the kind of priest that could get married. And his wife's name was Elizabeth. And they had been praying for years, for years, God, give us a son, give us a daughter. God, may Elizabeth get pregnant. For years, they had cried out to God. They had fasted about it, got on their knees, cried out to the Lord, Lord, open her womb. Those of you that are here that maybe have struggled with fertility issues know sometimes the the challenge of wanting to get pregnant, wanting to uh, be able to to, to have a son or a daughter, but it is delayed in the process. And you know the disappointment of going yet one more month and realizing no, The pregnancy has not happened. Well, Zacharias, the priest, and Elizabeth, his wife, had for years and years been wanting that pregnancy, and now they were older. They had stopped praying. They had kind of given up on the dream. It was in the back of their mind, but now they were older. It's like, "Eh, it's probably not going to happen now. My wife and Dee and I, when we first got married, um, we were happy not to have kids right away. But in the second or third year, we were like, okay, maybe now. Kind of getting excited about it. Into the fourth year, my wife really, really wanted to have children. And people start asking you, hey, any news? Hey, when are you guys going to have kids? Every time a child is born, people are saying, hey, it's your turn. Relatives, mothers-in-laws especially are worse about that. When are you going to give me grandkids? And so... We were asked so many times, and my wife started getting a little upset, like everybody's asking us, when are we going to have kids? So I said, honey, you just need to tell them, don't worry, we're practicing and having fun. (laughs) And so that's what I told her to tell people. People started, stopped asking so much, because I said, don't, no, no, we're practicing and having fun, but you know, God opens or closes the womb. But finally, in our sixth year, we had the elders pray over us. And um, they laid hands on us and prayed over us. And shortly after, a couple of weeks later, we found out she was pregnant and was a great joy. But Zacharias and Elizabeth waited the disappointment of not having a child. And so Zacharias, who was a priest, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And they would rotate among the priests who had that duty. Well, Zacharias happened to be rotating that year into the temple to serve the incense. So he went into the temple that time. All the people of Israel would wait on the outside because he'd go into the temple. And then when he came out, he would bless the people. So all the people gathered around the outside of the temple. Zacharias went in. They waited expectantly. When is Zacharias going to come out to bless us? And while he was in the temple... The angel of the Lord Gabriel appeared to him and he astounded him, frightened him. And he said, do not be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. And can I just pause there for a second and saying, you know, your prayers have been heard. I'm speaking to someone here who's been praying for a long time and you feel like my prayers are just bouncing off the ceiling. They're not. They're just like I'm speaking into the air and it's hitting on the tin ceiling and it's coming down. And some of you are lied to and start to think maybe God doesn't hear me. Can I tell you the God of the universe whose ear inclines to us that he hears your prayers? Just because God is not answering your prayer the way you expect him to answer your prayer, just because God isn't giving you the answer that you want when you want it, the time you want it, does not mean that God has not heard you. He is the God that hears. And God had been hearing Zacharias all these years, waiting for the proper time to manifest the answer to his prayer. 
You know, some of you, if God would have answered the prayer when you ask him, you would be in big trouble now. Aren't some of you super glad that God did not answer the prayer and let you marry that one guy you were praying that you should marry and later you found out, well, thank God I didn't marry him. Or let you get that job that later on turned out to be crazy, would have turned out to be crazy and thank God he didn't answer your prayer. So God sometimes waits for the exact time in his time, not ours, in which he answers our prayer. And so Zacharias is in the temple. He's shocked by the angel. The angel says, don't be afraid. Your prayers have been heard. Some of you need to hear that today. That's a word for someone. Your prayer has been heard even though the answer has not yet manifest into your life. Now, Zacharias, even though he had been praying for a long time, I believe that he let fear and let doubt get a hold of him. And so even though he has an angel, a supreme being manifesting himself in a temple, this big being manifesting himself in a temple, he doubts the word, wants a sign. And so God says, I'm going to give you a sign. Since you doubted, I'm going to make you mute. From the day now until your son is born, you won't be able to say a word, not one thing to your pregnant wife. Some of the wives are saying, I wish that would happen to my husband for a little bit. No, 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 don't be praying that now. Don't be praying that. So Zacharias comes out of the temple. All the people are looking at him, expecting him to bless them. And he walks out of the temple and he he can't say a word. Imagine trying to explain that you saw an angel, but you can't speak. (laughs) Kind of saying, I think... Zach finally, like, lost it. He's mute. He's unable to say anything. He goes to Elizabeth and his wife, and he tries to explain to her that he's going to have a, a child. And the Bible tells us that she soon became pregnant in her older years. And Elizabeth is with child now. The answer to the prayer Now, Zacharias is mute. He's not able to say, thank you, God. He's not able to speak into the life of that child. He's mute because he doubted. And while she is growing in her pregnancy, about five months into it, she has her niece comes over who has just found out that she's pregnant. And so you have two pregnant women in the room. And something extraordinary happens when the niece comes in. She comes into the room her, ma- her name is Mary. Elizabeth is there. The children that they're pregnant with will be second cousins. How many of you know some second cousins? They're second cousins. As soon as Mary walks in the room, Mary, yes, mother, the, the mother of Jesus, she walks into the room and Elizabeth, who's older and is pregnant with John, John the baptizer will be the second cousin of Jesus. The Bible says that John, the little, the the five-month-old child, jumps within the womb of his mother. I've always liked that story because you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the fact that he's jumping in the womb of his mother Because he's filled with the Holy Spirit when he comes into the presence of Jesus. And what it reminds me of is that even your unborn baby has a soul and has a spirit. And his spirit can be touched by the Holy Spirit. That there is a spiritual part of your baby. So, do we have any pregnant uh, moms in the house? Okay, right over here. Let me tell you something. Can I tell you something? How, How far along are you? Six months. Six months. So you were about like Elizabeth was. Can I tell you something? That child that you have inside of you already has a spirit. Do you know it's a boy or girl? Girl. That little girl that you have inside of you already has a spirit. And they may not understand the words that you speak, but they're affected by the spirit inside of you and by the Holy Spirit. I believe as you worship, that child's affected by your worship. I believe that the fact that you're in church and we're singing and the word of God is going forth, even though that child may not be able to understand the word, it's affected because your spirit affects that child's spirit, that the Holy Spirit can touch that child because that child inside of you already has a spirit, has a soul, and has a destiny inside of you already. Praise God for that.
When they were born, they would be born a few months apart. Elizabeth would name her son John. When the child was born, the relatives gathered around and they thought they would name it Zacharias. But Zacharias, the father, knew that the angel had said his name will be John. So he wrote down his name, John. And as soon as he wrote down the name, John, then his mouth was opened. And for the first time, he was able to speak after the birth of his son, And his son's name would be John the Baptizer. And John the Baptizer would baptize his second cousin named Jesus later on at the age of 30. Thank God for his marvelous, powerful promises. But I want to remind you of something. It was fear and doubt that kept Zacharias from fully accepting the answer of the prayer that he had been praying for for years. I'm wondering if someone here, God is trying to answer your prayer, because, but because it doesn't come packaged in the way that you expected it to come in, maybe you're afraid or you doubt whether God really hears your prayer. God doesn't always answer your prayer the way you want it, so don't let fear and doubt keep you from accepting the answer of prayer that God is giving you. Number two, the second person that I see in the Christmas story being told, do not be afraid, is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 30. There's a young peasant girl. Scholars say that she was probably no more than 16 years old. The age of a sophomore junior in high school today. Still pimples on her face, probably. Just a young girl. But yet this young girl has a powerful encounter and experience. She has been proposed to by her fiance, who's a carpenter named Joseph. He's a hard worker. He's a man that's been that's excited about marrying her. Like any young girl, she's super excited about her wedding. It's coming up. Something that's just kind of international all over the world. Little girls get excited about weddings. Period. I was at someone's house yesterday, visiting someone's house, and I was there. And a little four-year-old girl came up to me, and she heard that my daughter had got married. And she wanted to see pictures of the wedding. She's like, can I see the bride? Can I see the bride? Can I see the bride? Something about little girls that just want to see a bride. They think about it, dream about it. I don't know. It's kind of built into their system. They start thinking about the wedding, the dress, what they're going to look like. Anticipate the fact that people will look at them. It's their day. My daughter just got married a few months ago, four months ago. And man, I thank God that wedding's over. She was consumed in the wedding. And it's like any bride here knows the flowers and the decorations and the details of all all of it were just a major, major thing. The fiancés are like, and what do you think about the flowers? And they look good to me. So Mary's thinking about her wedding coming up. Her dream of starting her household with her young fiance. And by the way, in the Jewish culture, when you got engaged, it's not like in our culture where someone gives you a ring. And then, hey, if they decide halfway through it, this isn't going to work. They can bow, bow out of it as long as they get their deposit back from the reception hall. In the Jewish culture, when you were engaged, it was a legal binding document. And in order to get out of your engagement, you had to get a certificate of divorce. In other words, it was serious to be engaged. To get unengaged meant a legal process. And so the Bible tells us that Mary is anticipating her wedding. She's excited about it and she has an encounter as well. In Luke chapter 1 verse 30 it says, but the angel said to her, do not, what? Be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. And the angel goes on to tell Mary that God has chosen her in a special way and that she will give birth to a son that will be the Messiah. But he has to tell her, Mary, don't be afraid. And Mary has to consider this and think about this because this is really messing with her plans. 
Imagine it. I mean, she's just thinking, I want to get married. I have Joseph. And now you're telling me I'm going to get pregnant. And she asked, well, how can this be since I'm still a virgin? And the angel explains to her, you will be overshadowed with the most high. And the child that you have will be from on high. And I want to tell you something. Think about this. Mary, who is celebrated all over the world, Mary, who when you see pictures of the manger, she's in the center of it. Mary, who was a woman full of favor and blessed of God, called of God, the center of her calling, the, the thing that would make her famous, the thing that would she would be the conduit to bring God to earth. He would be born of a virgin, of a teenage girl. It would be the calling of her life. It would be the most radical, exceptional, powerful callings that any woman could ever expect to have. And she is afraid of it and considering whether she really even wants it. You know, sometimes fear and doubt keep us from stepping into the main calling of our life. Stuff that we don't understand. Write this down. Fear can keep you from stepping into the calling in your life. Some of us, our main calling, I believe, by the way, that everybody has a purpose and a plan for their life. I believe that God knows your name. I believe that God knows your calling, your gifting. I believe that you have a unique purpose that God has set out. It's not the same for everybody. And I believe that God wants to use you. You are made and designed by the most high God. He wants to fill you. He wants to be inside of you. He wants to bring out your gifting. He has designed you and engineered you for a purpose. But many of us spend most of our life, some of us all of our life, sidestepping the purposes of God, walking away from the purposes of God, afraid to step into the purposes that God has for us. If you're here today, let me tell you that the purpose, finding your purpose and really living your purpose in life starts by not being afraid to come to God and receive what he has for you. The best news ever is that Jesus came so that he could be the savior, the one that forgives, washes your sins, makes you new, comes inside of you, makes you a new person. He calls you first to Jesus. So many people spend their time rejecting a savior, afraid of coming to a savior and without knowing that your purpose and calling in life starts by an encounter with God. By the way, can I say this about Mary? Once in a while, I'll have someone that'll come to the church and say, I heard you guys don't believe in Mary. And can I just set the record straight? We absolutely 100% believe in Mary. She was a woman called by God, blessed by God, honored by God. God chose her so that Jesus could be born through her. She was an exceptional woman with an exceptional call. And in a unique time of history, she became the mother of Jesus. But what we don't do is we don't pray to Mary. The Bible tells us there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus the Christ. In fact, if you want to honor Mary the most, then don't insult Mary by praying to her. Pray to Jesus the Son who she gave birth to, who died on the cross, who's sinless, who's the Savior of the world. It's the greatest way that you could honor Mary is by worshiping the Son that she gave birth to. And by the way, sometimes people ask me, well, pastor, why did, why did she have to be born? Why did she have to be a virgin? Why couldn't it have been Joseph that, that just had normal uh, intercourse with his wife and give birth to Jesus? Because uh, I've explained this before, but, but Mary was at a place where she had to be, she couldn't give birth to a son that had a fallen sinful nature. Adam was created, the first man ever created, he was created without a sin nature. And the Bible calls Jesus the second Adam. The sin nature has been passed down from generation to generation through the seed of man. God had to bypass the seed of man so that Mary, Mary would not have a man's involvement in the birth of Jesus so that when Jesus was born, he was born without a sin nature. The first 
in generations and generations since Adam to be born without a sin nature. And Jesus lived a perfect life until he was uh, 30 years old. And then he was called into ministry and lived three years in public ministry. And on the third, on his 33rd year of life, he died on a cross being perfect, sinless, no sin on him, not a sin nature, not having sin so that he could be the perfect sacrifice, die on a cross and pay the sin for you and I so that we could have relationship with God. You say, well, why did Jesus have to be sinless? Jesus had to be sinless because it required a perfect lamb to pay for the sins of humanity. If Jesus had not been perfect, then he would be dying for his own sins. But it required someone that lived in perfection, someone that could only, only, only be God himself, the son of God, without sin. The perfect lamb slaughtered on our behalf is why Jesus came and died for us. But what strikes me about this story is that Mary, almost, almost because of fear, steps away from her main calling in life. Can I ask you this? Are you letting fear keep you from your calling? Are you letting fear keep you away from full surrender to God? Are you letting fear doubt what will it require? What will it mean? I mean, if I really surrendered to God, what would that look like? Are you living your life without living the fullness of your calling, without the Holy Spirit inside of you, living, transforming you because you're afraid of, well, what if I say yes to God? What will that mean? If you're letting fear keep you away from your main calling, then you may regret the way that you lived your life and one day stand before God and say, I wasted my life, God, because I let fear hold me back from how I could really be living in you. I'm so glad that Mary said, yes, I will be the chosen vessel. Yes, I will, I, will, I will be the one that carries the Jesus child inside of my womb, even though it may be hard to explain and it's going to make a mess of my wedding. I will say yes. Number three, the third time I, say, I see fear not in the scripture is to Joseph. Write this down. Fear can keep you from taking an important step of obedience. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, not in the Gospel of Luke, we don't see it, but we see it in Matthew. The Bible tells us that God, the angel, appeared to a man by the name of Joseph. Now, I don't know how Joseph, how old Joseph was. I imagine he was probably 18, 19 years old. He was a carpenter by trade, just a simple guy. And the Bible says that he found out that Mary was pregnant. Imagine, he's a righteous man. He fears God. He wants to do what's right. But his fiance shows up one day and says, I know this is going to be hard to believe. I'm pregnant. You're what? I'm pregnant, but it does not li- it's not like what it looks like. So I had this angel show up. He said, do you want to carry the child? And I said, yes. And Now I'm pregnant. He's like, "Mm." so he's considering. Is she is she lying to me? Is this the truth? Is you just been unfaithful? Made up a story about this? What should I do? In the Jewish culture, if you were engaged to be married, and someone committed adultery on you, or someone was unfaithful to you, in the Jewish custom. They could actually take that person out and they would, if they found out that someone had been unfaithful, drag them out in the street that all take rocks and they would stone that person to death. It was a penalty. It was a penalty that would be followed by death. Joseph knew this. If they find out, they could drag my fiance out in the street and kill her. And so Joseph decided 
He's considering, how can I quietly put her away? How can I quietly uh, do a divorce? She's a good girl. She got messed up. I can't believe she did this. How can I quietly put her away? I don't want to marry her if she's been unfaithful. She's not the woman I thought she was. I guess I'm just going to, his heart's broken. He's considering what to do. And the Bible says, after this consideration, an angel of the Lord appears. Those angels were busy in those days. The angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. And he says, Joseph, son of David, do not what? Be afraid. Now I want you to note that he calls Joseph the son of David. Joseph's father was not named David. And he's not talking about his direct father. He's talking about David, King David. And I don't know if you've ever read the genealogy that's in the beginning of Luke. It's the part that most people skip over. And -and so-and-so begat, so-and-so that begat, so-and-so that begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so how many, come come on, be honest, how many of you skipped that portion? I don't think anybody's ever come up to me and said, Pastor, I was reading the genealogy, and wow, God really spoke to me. Like, whoa, it was amazing, because in the one begot so-and-so, I really got a lot out of it. Unless you dig a little bit. But the reason the genealogy is there, it's like Ancestry.com. It traces your roots. And sometimes when you go back to your roots, you're a little bit surprised where your roots are. Years earlier, God had chosen a man by the name of David. We call him King David. And God had made a promise to David. And he said, David, I'm going to give you a kingdom. If you're faithful to me, I'm going to give you a kingdom that will have no end. And your kingdom will bless the entire world. You will have an everlasting kingdom. God was speaking to King David that through the lineage of David, Jesus would be born. This was a prophecy given hundreds of years before. The prophet also said that a virgin will be with child. There was prophecies given about a virgin being with child it being the lineage of David so the angel is reminding Joseph hey Joseph you have a story you have a history you have a destiny you are part of the lineage of King David can I just pause a moment and tell you that we all have a story that you don't operate in isolation Can I tell some of you that are here today that you're here because you had a parent, a grandparent, a great grandparent that prayed for you? Some of you have fought God tooth and nail, but you're here because you had a friend or relative or someone that prayed for you, that you would be here. And you're here even though you fought God, but God said, I'm going to, because of Because of the prayers of the parents, because of the blessing that I want to give to the parents, I'm going to pursue you. I'm going to chase after you until you surrender at the feet of Jesus. So some of you are here, not because you want it, because you have a grandmother, great grandmother, man, that prayed for you that you would come to know Jesus and you fought it. But you're here because of the destiny of what they passed on to you. I want you to know that God has known you before you were born. When you were in your mother's womb, he knew you. You're part of a narrative. You're part of a God history. And God was reminding Joseph, Joseph, you're part of a story. You have a purpose and a destiny. You're part of the genealogy of King David. So Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home with you as your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you something? Sometimes God asks us to take steps of obedience that no one else around us understands. Can you imagine Joseph trying to explain to his buddies, his cousins, his relatives, who are telling, are you crazy, dude? Why are you marrying her? Kick her to the curve. He said, no, I know it's hard to understand, but there's a purpose, there's a plan. I'm marrying this child has a destiny, a purpose. People don't always understand steps of obedience in God. People don't always understand. People may think it's crazy when you step out in faith instead of fear 
to do what you know God has called you to do. That happens all the time with people that are people of faith. They're stepping out in faith, doing what they know is right to do when others around them are saying, why in the world would you do that? Hey, you've been living with that boyfriend for four years and now you've come to Christ and you say, you know what? It, we got to move out. And your friends are saying, you just, bought, you just bought that couch together, man. Just got that apartment together. And you're saying, you know what? It doesn't make sense, but my body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. I've made a decision. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to do this the right way. And until I have a ring on my finger, I'm, I'm going to do this in a way that honors and blesses God. And your friends are like, are you nuts? Are you crazy? Why are you doing this? Some of you just got baptized this year. Raise your hand if you just got baptized this year. All right, there's a whole bunch of you. Yeah, praise God for those that took a step of believer's baptism. You know, some of you had relatives that didn't understand what you're doing. Now, why are you getting baptized? I thought you were already baptized. Why are you doing that? But you're getting baptized in Jesus' name because you've chosen to follow Jesus Christ and have chosen to do that. And your friends are saying, I don't understand. Why are you doing this? Why did you clean up your language? Why are you going to church? Why are you reading your Bible? Why are you acting this way? Why are you changing? What's going on with you? They don't understand steps of obedience that you're taking because when you really surrender your life to Christ, you make Jesus the center of your life and you do things that the world may not understand but ultimately have a purpose and a plan that makes sense in God's agenda. Joseph said yes to Mary, even though it would mess his life and all the people around him didn't understand. He said, I will marry this woman. I will take this step of obedience out of my love for God. Number four, the last fear not that I see in scripture in the Christmas story is found in Luke chapter two, verse 10. It says the angel appears to a group of people that are out in the fields by night. By the way, do you know that Jesus more than likely wasn't born in December? I know I'm messing with some of your Christmas, like your pastor, don't tell me that. More than likely, Jesus was born in late September or early October. Because that's when the shepherds were out in the field with their sheep. But, but can I just say this? I don't care when he was born. I just want to celebrate Jesus. December, October, November. December's as good a time as any to celebrate that Jesus the King was born. So don't let that take away from your Christmas. But more than likely, Jesus was born end of September, beginning of October. And here's the crazy thing about this. The angels could have appeared to anybody. They could have appeared to the king in the palace. They could have appeared to the priest in the temple. They could have appeared to the aristocrats, the governors, the rulers, and announced a king is being born. But it's crazy that the angels decide to appear, a host of heavenly angels decide to appear to a pretty low class group of people called the shepherds. The shepherds were considered sort of people that couldn't get any other job, got the job of a shepherd. They were low class, a little bit smelly, hung out in the fields, low education, despised by a lot of people actually. Looked down upon by many. I grew up in northern Spain in a little village called Rubena. My best friend when I was in grade school was the son of a shepherd. Literally sheep shepherd. His name was Jose Luis. And the people of the village actually kind of looked down on him. His dad would go out in the field early in the morning with 400 sheep. Go to the hills around the village where I grew up in. 
He was kind of quiet, very tanned, wrinkled because he spent hours and hours by himself with the sheep and his sheep dogs out in the fields. He always smelled like sheep. The people in the village kind of looked down at him like, that's a low job. You're a guy that smells like animals. You have no education. You're out in the sheep, very similar to the days of Jesus, where this is a group of shepherds that's out in the hills. And I love the fact that God says, you know what? I'm going to choose a group of people to show up to. Not the kings, not the princes, not the intellectuals. Not the rich, not the famous, not the power brokers. I'm going to choose a group of people because, listen to what he says. But the angel said to them, what's our phrase? Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for whom? Oh, say it together. All people. You know, God wanted us to know that the gospel is good news, not for the good, all people. This is for the black, the white, the Hispanic, the Asian, all people. The good news is for anybody that comes to Jesus Christ. There is no bigotry in the kingdom of God. There is no racism in the kingdom of heaven. There is no... This is not just for good people. This is for all people. All people. Yeah, this is for the person that came out of 26 and Cal. All people. This is for the tatted up gangbanger that thinks he doesn't belong in a church. This is for all people. This is for the woman that's been divorced three times and feels rejection. It's for all people. This is for the ex-prostitute that thinks God could never love me. This is for all people. Yeah, this is for the person that's committed murder in his life. This is for all people. This is for the low, for the rich, for the high, for the in-between. This is for the old, for the young, for the teenager, for the woman. This is the gospel, the good news that's given for all people and, and spoken out to the shepherds so that everybody would know there's not a person on the face of this world that cannot be touched by the power and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is for all people. People, aren't you glad it's for us, for the broken, the hurting, the outcast, the marginalized? And if you're here today, maybe thinking, what am I doing in church? I'm not a church person. I hope they don't figure out that when he says, Luke, I don't even know what that is. I hope they figure out when they sing the songs. I don't know any of those songs. I hope they figure out that although that I'm dressed in Sunday dress code, like I'm more comfortable in a bar than I am in a church. If you're feeling that way today, I'm so glad you're here. I'm really, really happy you're here. Because in your mind... You may have been lied to to think I don't belong in a place like that. That's for good people. I want to tell you that the gospel is for all people. Yeah, for you too. God appeared to the shepherds because he called them to be the first that would come and kneel. At the feet of King Jesus. Here's the teenage mom. That he said don't fear. Here's the father. Joseph that he said don't fear. And here's the shepherds. That show up stinky. Dirty. They bow their knee. And they celebrate the fact that the good news of great joy has come that's good for all people. And so today I want to close our time together with something that we tend to do every Christmas Sunday. I like to remind you that 
When Jesus was in the world, he said, I'm the light of the world. But when he left, he said, now you are the light of the world. And so we're going to close with just a little bit of a candlelight ceremony here. You should have been given a candle when you walked into this place. We have one flame here symbolizing the light of Christ. And from one flame, we're going to light every candle in this place. I know some of you like to bypass the product, bypass the process, especially you smokers like to pull out your, I got a pastor. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't bring your own candle. We got a system here. We got to go one flame. Sometimes I'm here and I'll see, I see light starting in the background. Come on. Who's the smokers lighting up the back already? We got a system here. We got a system. Follow the system. This one candle symbolizes Jesus. Can I tell you this? You're going to go to homes, some of which are very absent of Jesus. Christmas Eve, you're going to gather with family members who maybe have little Jesus that they're thinking about. I want to challenge you if you're here today and you have the light of Jesus inside of you that you bring some Jesus to whatever celebration you're going to be at. What if you are the one this Christmas Eve at your family gathering that says, hey, can we stop and just say a word of prayer? Some of them are going to say, what? Were you a priest, a pastor or something? But how about pausing and really thinking about what this time is about? Can I talk to you fathers? What if on Christmas morning, you did a tradition that I've been doing since years, since my kids were small. We give up and get up and before we open the gifts, we sat down on the couch beside the Christmas tree and I open up a kid's Bible and read the Christmas story. Remind them, hey, we're giving gifts. It's a time of celebration, but let's not forget what this is all about. This is about the God-man being born, being a gift to humanity that changed the world. What if you took initiative? Dads, I just have to warn you in advance. My kids, they would sit down. I'd want to read the story. And they were always like, Dad, come on, hurry. Because, you know, they're looking at the gifts right there. So it was, it's hard to concentrate. It's, it's a tough one. What if you dads would take the initiative? What if you single mom, before you open any gifts, would open up a little kid's Bible or you would tell the story of Jesus and remind your children that the reason that we celebrate is because Jesus was born all God, all man, and was the greatest gift to humanity where salvation comes to. What if you brought a little bit of light to whatever celebration what if on Christmas Eve you sing happy birthday to Jesus? What if you sing a carol that, that lifts up Jesus? What if you stop at one of your gatherings and say, why don't we all pause and give thanks to God? You are the light now. Bring a little light to whatever celebration you are at. You say, Pastor, you don't know my family. They're all going to get drunk. Well, before they get drunk, have a little Jesus in there. Seriously, we are the light of the world. We bring hope as we point to Jesus. We bring a sense of, hey, God loved us so much. This is the essence of the gospel, the good news for all people. So I'm going to ask that you stand with me. Today, symbolically, Jesus is the light of the world. And we ask that this flame would spread from home to home, house to house, family to family, person to person. In a time of chaos, loneliness, confusion, materialism, may we bring the presence of Jesus to everywhere we're at, especially Christmas morning and Christmas Eve. I charge you and encourage you Bring the presence of Jesus.